Welcome all. A bit of a history and an introduction to digital modes. It's not a, a very technical presentation by any stretch of the imagination, but it basically uh, starts at the beginning and works through. Got some sound bites as well, so people can hear what they are, so we'll, we'll get stuck into it. So we start with code back in the uh, spark gap days and uh, then CW. We all know there wasn't one code, there was multiple um, back then as uh, things moved from the wire to the wireless world. Uh, one of the things uh, I introduce here is that, uh, sorry for the size, um, migrated, uh, it uses a very code, so various character lengths. And there's actually five in Morse, um, so it makes it a quinary system. It's the dit, the dar, the inter-element gap, so that gap between the dit and the dar, um, the gap between the characters and the gap between the words. And it's, it's really important to understand that you know, there are those five different unique characters um, or symbols uh, in, in the system, especially when we start talking about some of the other digital modes. We all know it can be ex ex uh, executed with some of the simplest equipment. Um, more easily read by humans than by machine and uh, you know, I think anybody who's tried to decode CW or Morse with uh, a PC or hardware uh, has, has gone through the frustration curve and uh, realised that trying to learn it by ear is probably the best way to go. It does form the benchmark of performance for pretty much all the digital modes. Everybody will compare it back to uh, CW with a good operator under whatever conditions. <coughs> Excuse me, I have been losing my voice over the week. Now we use it for weak signal work. Um, so you can have uh, QRSS, the really slow stuff, which is done by computers and uh, has dits of 30 seconds of length. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, um, there, there are some really high-speed operators, QRQs, who are doing uh, in excess of 100 words a minute, uh, machine keying, but still reading by ear. And uh, so what they have found is that um, they can actually hear the whole, the whole words or whole phrases by ear, basically memorise those patterns. But in order to get the keying accuracy, anything over about 40 or 50 words a minute, um, almost becomes impossible to hand key accurately so that they will type it and, and actually have it machine sent. Um, and this is in a QSO mode, not just um, five character blocks or call sign blocks. Um, I've said it there, we recently used it to bounce some signals off Venus. It's a five minute round trip. Uh, the moon's two and a half seconds, I think. Um, it was done by a group of German operators a couple of years ago to prove that you could send a space vehicle to Venus and actually be able to communicate with it. Um, so Ham's leading the way again. It can be human coded, uh, keyed at 60 words a minute. That's probably about the limit um, of hand keying. And um, can be read at a minus 10 dB signal to noise ratio, what they say by a competent operator under normal conditions. Bandwidth is somewhere between 100 and 150 hertz. And there is software out there to send and receive it. But the uh, receive software is pretty ordinary, shall we say. Um, I'm sure we've all heard it, but to keep the... Uh, Consistency. Why is it so soft? Don't ask me what it was. <laughs> I'm still learning. Okay, so, and that was basic 1860s. Some of the first uh, radio waves actually got transmitted in labs, you know, the odd metre, two metres, um, into the 90s where we started seeing Marconi and the guys coming along. 1910, radio teletype. Nine, yeah, it's actually, some of the years will, will surprise people how far back it goes. Um, but yep, once again, jumped off the wire. Uses a Unicode, so um, all characters are fixed length, uh, five bits. Um, there's a fixed space length um, as well. It uses frequency shift keying. There's, there's effectively two tones that it shifts between, denoting a mark or a space, uh, or what we commonly know in digital modes as one and zero. Um, it has a limited character set, five bits giving you 32 characters. And it, so therefore, use the shift function as one of those characters to get numbers, some symbols, and uppercase. There's no error correction uh, in ready. Uh, it was originally sent and received entirely in hardware, 1910. Um, but that said, you turn the bands on these days, especially on the digital contest, RIDI is very much alive and present on the bands. T go up on 20 metres and you'll hear RIDI, 40 and 80. There's plenty of RIDI activity. Uh, why? Operates at a 45 board. 
uh, which gives most operators about 60 words a minute. And that's a pretty comfortable conversation speed, quicker than PSK and a lot of the other modes. So, yep, tolerate the uh, lack of error correction, but uh, rip through those QSOs in contest mode. Uh, unlike most digital modes, it's transmitted, well, the, the, uh, the gentleman's agreement is to transmit in lower sideband. And uh, that, that is a trap for people who play in the digital modes, and most digital modes, doesn't matter where they appear on the bands, will be done in upper sideband. Ready is, the op is actually done in lower sideband. Um, so you'll hear the signals, you go, why can't I decode it, why can't I decode it? It's actually because the mark and space is going to be the opposite way around. Um, most software will assist in decoding, because what it'll do, it'll, it'll do a shift on space. So as soon as it sees a space, it'll actually basically go back to lowercase letters. It assumes that the space is after a set of numbers or capitals, and then for revert back to lowercase, because it assumes the next lot of characters are going to be lowercase text. Um, it will do a reverse, so it'll do that mark space frequency reversal for you. It'll also do auto frequency correction, basically to get the, those mark and space frequencies spot on. Um, 60, 67 words a minute at minus 5 dB signal noise ratio is an uncommon. And uh, I've got a little, spectrogra little spectrograph down the bottom. You can see the two tones there. And uh, for those that are uh, wondering what it might sound like or haven't heard it, Very distinct. You can hear the two tone, and it just wobbles between the two. Um, if you have any questions at any time, just jump in. 1920s, the Germans looked to hell. And um, again, sent basically is, is like a fax uh, mode. Um, there was only two signals, on and off. Um, so the mode was Hell Shriver, and the background image is actually uh, a computer readout of what it would look like uh, these days. It had built-in redundancy, but it was done in a physical form, in that um, in the receiver to correct for any physical uh, misalignments or propagation um, difficulties, uh, all of the text was actually printed twice. So if it scrolled off the page due to a phasing or a, an alignment issue, you could still read what was being transmitted. Um, so you can actually see in the background how yeah, everything written basically twice. <coughs> Comes in a, a variety of flavours as I said, um, and I use the term flavours, speeds, bandwidths and, and uh, rates, uh, ultimately rates. Um, but yeah, it was an on and off transmission basically uh, causing ink to be made onto a paper tape or, or not. Um, and yeah, there's actually an image there of one of the last, I think it is the only working Hellschreiber machine from that vintage. And that's actually a transceiver, uh, the keyboard's in there and the paper tape for receiving. Um, all transmissions were done in uppercase. Um, typical speeds, 122.5 dots per second, gives you about 30 words a minute. Um, or you can achieve uh, 25 words a minute at that signal noise ratio. Bandwidth of that signal, because it is only a single effectively frequency, on and off, 75 hertz. Um, it, has a, it has a dedicated following, you'll hear it on the air. What's it sound like? Anyone want to have a guess? Think of it like a crackly Morse code, because what it is, it's just a single on and off signal, and all it's causing is basically an impregnation of the ink onto the paper. That was the most common mode. Bit of a gap. We had a war in there and a few other things, and there's a lot of other... Um, technical advances, but just not in the modes. Um, but we get to the, the 50s, and um, SSTV. Came in two flavours, really. Um, this is more like ATV than anything, um, because it was done using uh, a camera transmitting, and then uh, the persistence of phosphors onto a, uh, onto a CRT or a, a tube. Um, the typical spectrum is there, what it would look like, and on the left hand side is actually um, a picture of most would recognise from the Apollo missions, um, and that was actually taken off the retransmission out of parks that was received in Sydney before it got broadcast onto television. Um, grabbed that one off the net because it actually showed that the net also shows a uh, image of what was rebroadcast and how poor the, the image quality that went out was. Um, whereas you can see actually quite a lot of detail on the visors and things in that. So the receive signal, 
I won't give you a spectrum, we'll come back to that. I uh, won't give you a sound bite, we'll give, come back to that a little bit later. Um, in the 90s. Packet. Who, who, who here's played with Packet? On wire. Right? Because this, uh, this probably is one of the biggest things that happened in amateur radio in some ways, in terms of the digital, in the digital history. Um, in the 70s, Yep, based on the old wire, X25 protocols that used to be running on computer networks, a bunch of amateurs got together, um, butchered the, the protocol a little bit and turned it into amateur X25. 7-bit character set, like the old ASCII character set that we're, those of us who played with computers would be aware of, gave us a full um, uh, character set. What, what it did, took the data, broke it up in little chunks, which what they called packets, and then tra transmitted that and put some error correction into the, into the uh, protocol. Uh, in order to build up networks, which is where this all pretty much went, and there was an extensive network developed in Australia, um, there were some competing standards for how networks would be built. And uh, for those that were around at the time, I'm sure they can remember the ROSE versus the NetROM war. This was before my time, so I can only go by uh, what I've read. But uh, uh, those that I have spoken to who have done, were around and doing packet in the 70s and 80s you know, will remember the... Uh, the, the two factions, shall we say, in the uh, in the packet world. Uh, it gave email-like services before um, before the internet was publicly available um, by uh, things called mailboxes, which basically sat on people's computers or hard or other hardware. Um, you could store data like a bulletin board service, so files got dumped there and people could retrieve them. Um, and it was very popular through the 80s and into the 90s basically got, got displaced by the rise of the internet, becoming publicly, pretty much publicly available in the 90s. <laughs> it does make a comeback a little bit later on. Um, in the 70s, most of it was done in hardware. It was a terminal device, a TNC, and a radio. Uh, so usually a dumb, compu a dumb terminal, um, basically a screen with a serial interface on it. TNC, which did the serial to <laughs> audio, and then plug that in the radio. And uh, there were things like the Cantronics, the, I mean, I've got a pack rat, and there were a whole bunch of others, including kits that could be built. Um, Mir, for those that remember Mir, um, had a packet station on board and uh, was, was very regularly used. The International Space Station still runs packet. Um, it actually has uh, a bulletin board service on there and mailboxes. Uh, because it basically the MIR equipment got translated out of MIR and into um, the ISS. And uh, there's currently two modes, um, 1200 BPS or bits per second running the old Bell 202 for those that were in the uh, telephone industry, uh, running on, on two metres and the 300 BPS running Bell 101 on HF, um, predominantly on 30 metres, pretty, most, pretty much the most popular band for HF uh, packet. Um, there is a 9600 BPS version available, but it requires some very careful uh, tinkering with the, the transceivers um, in terms of their, uh, their modulation. What's it sound like? This is a 300 BPS s signal. You don't want to be listening to that all day. It's one of the risks when playing digital modes is actually having that, that sort of stuff going all the time. Um, back to the 90s and we get slow scan television comes back. Comes back with a bit of a vengeance. Why? PCs are now on the... Um, you know, if you look at the 80s, we had VIC-20s and Commodore 64s and a, somebody may have an, an, an Amstrad or uh, an Amiga, Apple IIe's. Um, in the 90s, it was pretty much you know, what we know as a PC today. And... Um, so they had, not only do we have PCs, but we also had audio functionality on those PCs now. So that could uh, displace the TNC, the hardware, and um, that allowed some of the programs to be written that we see. Three popular flavours. Robot um, is used both by uh, Europe and the US. Mainly Europe likes to play with what they call Martin 1, and the US likes to play with what they call Scotty 1. And um, it's just d slightly difference in the... Um, in the tones and the encoding that the or the transmission codes that they use, um, a number of the space vehicles have transmitted SSTV. So we've had uh, the recent um, spacesuit or the uh, sorry, 
Arasac that got thrown out of the ISS, that was doing SSTV, the ISS does it on about two or three times a year, at short notice usually. Um, Mir did it. Um, so yeah, th there's been a lot of um, space-based uh, SSTV. Uh, generally, the modulation's FM coming out, uh, sitting in a standard 2.3 kHz channel, um, and the frequencies are there, start, stop bits, uh, ones and zeros. There's a leader tone at 1900 also, just for tuning up on. And most of the SSTVs will actually, um, when they start up on that leader tone, um, transmit a code that will tell you, the software, what mode it's operating in. So the software can actually automatically switch that mode for decoding. Um, what's it sound like? Oh, the images are um, from here and from the recent um, Arasat. Um, this one's actually out of Arasat when the satellite got thrown out. It's gone quiet on me. Okay, we'll move on. APRS, called the Packet Strikes Back 1992, created by Bob, um, WB4 APR. He created APRS as a situational awareness tool, mainly for things like the hurricane season in the, in the states. Um, a state there that it's probably underutilized, and that most people only really know it as uh, tracking vehicles and people. Um, so sort of the, the more common application of uh, APRS. It utilizes the AX25, so it is packet um, in its uh, as its basis. Available on two meters and, and, and HF, as I said. Um, can be used in fixed locations. A number of the repeaters now uh, around Sydney are running APRS to identify what frequency the repeaters are operating on. Um, I think the one out of Man's Plains also gives coastal warnings. And I actually, when I was preparing this at the beginning of the month, there was a repeater giving um, sheep warnings because we had that, that cold weather and the, the rain coming through. And actually giving warnings out to the graziers to uh, you know, take their, their, their flocks to higher ground uh, because of the flood risks. Um, so it is, it is starting to give that sort of information, weather stuff out of the BOM, um, grazier warnings, all those sorts of things. Um, as I said, the ISS does run a packet station. It's a digipeter, so it'll actually repeat uh, these signals down. Um, you don't need much power or a great setup to hit um, the International Space Station. It flies over. It's only 230 k's away. Um, not a bad tool in receive. No transmit, receive. Just see what your FM, uh, your two meter station can hear. Um, because it sends out little bursts of information and actually gives you a little map, uh, which is the background image there, of the coverage. You have to be careful that you're not picking up stuff that is being digipeted, but that it, you're, you are receiving directly off the air. Um, but you will be surprised how far you can hear. Um, you might not be able to carry on a, you know, an FM voice conversation, but this, that these packets can actually make it through. Um, as we said, because it's, it's packet, it does have some error, forward error correction in there. Um, used by travellers when they're out in the open road, often to uh, notify others that they're, they're present and uh, what communication, what channel, or frequency they might be listening on other than their APRS so that you know, they, they can render assistance or just keep each other awake. Um, effectively, it'll do 300 words a minute. It's a very fast mode. Um, but you need pretty good signal to noise ratio to be doing that. Uh, plus 20 signal to noise there. And depending on which mode you're using, the, f the bandwidth is somewhere between 200 hertz and basically 2 or 2.3 K. Um, obviously on HF, it's, it's, it's a lot narrower. Um, we'll see if the sound bites come back. Either that or I've lost them because I've moved the uh, files. So that's a, that's a little packet burst, basically, for APRS. Again, you don't want to be listening to that while you're driving along.